Greetings, fellow seekers of Mysterious. Welcome to Paranormal M, the channel that dives deep into the uncharted territories of the supernatural. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment, and embark on a journey into the enigma with our latest mind-boggling stories. We hope you're ready for an otherworldly experience. Oil Field True Story The Haunted Ship I work in the offshore oil and gas industry, oil field for short. The work that my crew and I do often has us working with our equipment set up on board ships called offshore supply vessels and boats. They're owned by another company. Also, I live and work in Asia. I'm having deja vu. We normally have a crew of 15 to 20 packs on the job site, and that's at any given time. We don't have specific shifts, like day or night. We just work whenever the requirement arises or the client requests. In most cases, this means we'll be working 24 to 36 hours straight. The Story This one time, the client engaged our company to charter a supply boat and set up our equipment on board to do a job at an offshore drilling rig. Our equipment is huge. 800 horsepower, 20 foot by 8 foot large diesel driven units each, and pretty much occupied the whole deck of the boat. Things started up normally. We set up the equipment, took a weeks of hard work, sailed out of the port, got to the drilling rig on schedule. There was some other operational stuff going on, so we waited on standby near the rig for a couple of weeks, floating about and killing time. This is where the quote-unquote fun starts. I mentioned earlier that we had about 15 guys on my crew, and there were another 20 guys who made up the boat's crew. Plus, the boat isn't that huge, so there's always another human being probably within shouting distance. It started the night we got on location. At breakfast, a couple of my guys were sitting all zombified and exhausted. They said that they had a bad bout of sleep paralysis. Now, this can happen occasionally, especially, or should I say, as a result of really hard physical exertion for prolonged periods. So the moment you collapse and have a good deep rest, your body can in fact experience what seems to be sleep paralysis. <sighs> no biggie, since we just spent a whole week and day and night rigging up heavy equipment and piping. We shrugged it off went back to sitting around shooting the breeze. After all, we had a couple of weeks of nothing to do on standby, so with plenty of rest it wouldn't happen again. We were wrong. The next night, a few other guys got it. Then the following night, a few other guys experienced it too. And every single night, random guys experienced it. There was no pattern. There was no exception. Eventually, everybody had experienced it. Some reported being able to open their eyes and see a dark figure pressing down on them in their bunk beds. A couple more religious ones tried reciting prayers during the episodes, only to have the choking feeling just intensify. Morale was taking a beating. Isolated cases in the past we could laugh off since there was a reasonable explanation and correlation to the physical work that we did. This time, something was very wrong. The whole crew was getting it, and we literally had zero physical work at all. Still, we gave each other what moral support that we could to get through the days and nights. In the mornings, we knew. Tired, drawn expressions. The sunken eyes. The dark circles. We knew who it had come for the previous night. And that's not all. If you've worked offshore... You'll know sometimes standby time is the hardest, because we quickly run out of ideas to pass the time. So, we got busy and found things to do. Started running through the preventative maintenance and startup checks on our equipment, running the units, so that the moment we got the green light from the crew, or the client, we'd be ready to go at full throttle. It came at us there, too. Strange sounds on deck, amongst the equipment. I was on deck one evening after dinner with five other guys working on one of the diesel engines. 
Suddenly, a huge metallic boom rang out from the aft deck. Sounded like somebody took a 10-pound sledgehammer and slammed it into one of the metal bulkheads. I got up to go aft and just check it out, thinking maybe it might have been a loose lube oil drum or one of the units not being shimmed properly. The supervisor grabbed my arm and said, Not now, tomorrow, in daylight. I was about to protest, but seeing the look in his eyes, I backed down. In the morning, me and the other guys went to check the aft deck. Nothing. Equipment skids were shimmed tight. Everything secured tight as it should be. And the previous night, there was nobody at the aft deck area. But every night from then on, the same boom. The same place without fail. Another thing, the vessel's crew refused flat out to say anything when asked about these things. Sure, they were friendly and great guys to work with, but when this topic came up, they simply clammed up tight. And weirdly enough, they also absolutely refused to ever come out on deck after nightfall. Daytime was fine. They would help with any requests at all, but after dark, nope. Want a spare part from the deck store during the day? Fill out forms, wait outside while the boson goes and gets it for you? Nobody goes inside my store after dark. It's free for all. The deck crew, not even the fussy boson, would come out of the deck. Go ahead and take what you need yourselves. Just fill it in the logbook. The final straw came once it was time to finally get to work. For context, we had an electrician who was a white American. Jack, awesome guy. Chill as fuck. Skeptical when it comes to weird happenings, though. He was the one guy in the crew who would laugh off everything that happened. He would always just say we were imagining things. So in a way, he helped us keep our sanity, which is important for later. The job starts. The big diesel units are running at full throttle. Listen to the 3,000 horsepower choir sing. Everyone is giving it their all. And we're done in about 24 straight hours. Client is happy. Time to sail home. Crew shuts down the equipment, pats each other on the back, and heads to the locker room. It's about 2 a.m. at this point. Wait, where's Jack? Jack was curled up in a ball in the locker room, in a tiny gap between the lockers and the wall. A mound of cigarette butts on the floor at his feet. He was rocking back and forth, chain-smoking furiously. And by the way, he doesn't chain smoke. He was pale, shaking, eyes wild and muttering over and over again. What the fuck, man? What the fuck did I just see? What the fuck was that thing? We heard what happened from our mechanic. He was with Jack at the aft deck. That was near the railing when they both saw a white man-sized bundle fall from the drilling rig. It's like a jack-up rig, a 30-meter drop from the rig floor to sea level went into the sea with a loud, audible splash. Hang on. These guys are standing right behind the diesel engines. 140 decibels loud with earmuffs on and they heard a splash. Jack was really excited thinking it might be a man overboard, wanting to throw himself just a life ring and jump in to save him. When the mechanic grabbed Jack, pulled him back from where he was about to climb over the railing and dragged him backwards... Jack started to argue. That's when they saw something moving in the water. For context, it's dark like midnight. We're out in the open sea. The sea is choppy. If anyone fell into the sea in these conditions, good luck to you. This thing, they saw it. It was submerged and coming toward the boat, making a V-wave as it came. Jack continued arguing as if it was in a trance that a man was overboard. He needed to rescue the person, started climbing the rail again. Mechanic slaps him and says, Jack, whatever that is, it's not human. We're fucking going now. Next thing we know, we found Jack huddled in the locker room out of his damn mind. He couldn't even muster a coherent sentence. It took him a couple of days to regain his composure after that incident. Thankfully, the journey back to port was short, 20-hour sailing time. We were all too motivated to disassemble all the equipment soon after we reached the soar and just got the hell off of that boat in record time.
A ghost walked into my bedroom. When I was a child in elementary school, I saw a ghost. I lived in an old farmhouse in the cornfields of Ohio with my mother, father, brother, and various animals. To help explain a little, I'll try to tell how the house was set up. It was close to the road with a gravel driveway. The front door faced the street, but most of us used the side French doors that we built a deck off of. The French doors opened into a big dining slash entry room. To the right was our bathroom and to the left was the living room. The only time we used the front door was when we headed out to the bus and when my mom left for work on days that a friend would pick her up. The front door opened into the living room and was right next to the stairs. On the other side of the stairs on the first floor is my brother's bedroom. You go up the closed stairs and on either side of the top were other two bedrooms and on the left was mine and on the right was my parents. I cannot remember how I got woken up. I'm a light sleeper and would usually wake up to the sound of my mom getting ready for work. She had to get up around 4.30 every morning because she worked at a factory over an hour away. So that's how I knew when all this happened. I do remember my stomach being upset, so I went across the small hall and told my dad. He said to just lay in bed with him, try to relax and get some sleep. After a while of doing that and hearing my mom get ready downstairs, I was starting to fall asleep. I remember hearing a car pull up out front, my mom slamming the front door shut because she locked the door handle and that's how you had to shut it, so I knew the door was locked. I also heard a car door slam shut and finally the car drove away. I can't say how much time passed after that as I was drifting in and out of sleep but I really didn't think too much because I thought my mom had forgotten something. But I heard the side French doors open and shut. Still thinking this was my mom, I figured I'd hear some hurried motions, perhaps her rushing out of the door again. But I didn't. I heard nothing. After a minute or two, the stairs started to creak. It sounded like a normal walking pace of someone who was quietly trying to make their way up, but not hiding their presence. All the while, my dad was fast asleep still. I feel like you know the house you grew up very well. I knew those stairs and the sounds that they made. There was one stair in particular that was like halfway up. It made a louder creaking sound than the others. So, when I heard that, I knew they were almost at the top of the stairs. Then the part that made me think I was in a dream state... I heard what sounded like they stepped on a piece of paper on the stairs. Almost like a loosely balled up piece of paper being stepped on. You know that sound? Weird, I know, but I'll always remember that part and thinking about how odd it was. I was laying on my side facing the window the entire time. The window that overlooked my driveway. So I would have seen or heard my mom going down the driveway if she came in through the side doors. Finally, putting the pieces together that this wasn't my mom, I turned over, looked across the room at the door. I saw someone walk in. There was a nightlight by the door. They stood in front of it. I heard their feet shuffle on the carpet. They were tall, and I saw a glint of glasses. There were no features or colors, just a shadow. It had a square-looking head. I didn't see legs, but it appeared to be wearing a nightgown. So it was just a blob of shadow. I propped myself up on my elbows, terrified, and saw the nightlight shining through it. It just stared at me. I was so scared I couldn't move or speak. I have no idea how much time had passed. Us just staring at each other the whole time. Eventually, it just walked out. Didn't go back down the stairs either. Didn't open or shut any doors, just left down the hall. I finally collapsed onto the bed and tried to wake my dad and was quickly dismissed. My only thought was that they must have gone into my room. When it was time for all of us to wake up and get ourselves ready for the day, I told my dad and brother what had happened, and my brother said he used to see the square-headed man as well. He'd be at the bottom of his bed when his bedroom was in mine. My mom later told me that it was her grandpa 
because she used to see glimpses of someone walking from her room to mine when he passed. He wore glasses, had a fishing cap, made his head look square. Now we just think that he was only checking in on us, but I never slept in that room again all the way until we moved when I was 12. That was the last time I saw him, but I can't say for the same about my dad. He saw him years later, and in another house we all moved to. I was freshly out of high school when we had a bad ice storm. Had no power for a week. My mom and dad fell asleep in the living room, dad in his chair and mom across from him on the couch. As he woke up, he saw a man standing over her, watching her. He didn't see a face, but he knew by the shape of it that it was an old man. He disappeared as soon as he knew my dad was looking at him. That's just one of many times I've experienced a ghost sighting. Weird light outside tent. Scratches. This happened a few years ago on a camping trip, but it feels like yesterday. Me and my friend, both teen girls at the time, we were sleeping a few yards from her aunt's trailer in a little tent. After goofing off for a while, we settled down. I faced one side of the tent and she faced the other. I was just starting to fall asleep when I could tell a bright light was illuminating the tent. You know where you can tell the lights are on, even when your eyes are closed? Assuming it was a car or something of sort driving by, I kept trying to sleep. I heard an odd scratching sound, but I didn't think much about it. I felt my friend tap my shoulder, but for some reason thought she had just rolled over while sleeping and had done it by accident. Finally, another tap to the shoulder. I slowly and quietly turned to face her side of the tent. There was an incredibly bright light, brighter than any flashlight I've seen. It was pointing straight at the tent. There was only one point of light, so it couldn't have been a car. The best comparison I could draw is a motorcycle. But we would have heard a motorcycle approach the tent, or any vehicle for that matter. This wasn't the scary part, though. It looked as though some kind of hooked saw-like object was being dragged slowly against the fabric of the tent. It made a like, very much visible sort of thing by the abrasive light. But we couldn't see anything holding it up. Then the light just switched off and we didn't hear or see anything else that night. When we worked up the courage to book it for a few yards to the trailer her aunt was in, we didn't see anyone or anything out of place outside. After we got inside, she told, well, before I had turned around to look at whatever she had seen, multiple shapes similar to the weird hooked saw thing were very clearly dragged against the tent. Still, had nothing seemed to hold them up. All equally terrifying and sharp looking, but nothing like I'd ever seen. Looked like the contents of a tool box from hell. Something else in the house. Over the last year, I've had a handful of recognizable brushes with something that just doesn't like me. And the feeling is mutual. A year ago, my girlfriend invited me to move in with her full time. I'd stayed over before for a weekend. Nothing seemed off about the place or the living arrangement itself, but... I didn't get goose pimples or a sense of dread when I roamed around the place. Shortly after her invitation, I chose to move in with her. She was rather insistent that I moved in immediately. I decided just to pull up stakes and find a job in the area after I moved in. This meant I spent most of the day alone in the house. It took a lot longer than I thought it would to get an entry-level job in the area. After a while, I sort of took to laying in bed for an hour or two out of the day. That's when I started to notice strange noises. They sounded like radio commercials and music, though I could never quite make out what was said. The voices had the tones of males and females, but all I could hear was garbled nonsense. 
Just recall radio commercials for local businesses, interspersed with a semi-discordant music. You'd probably be close to the mark if you imagined that. A little while after that, I started having vivid, jarring dreams. In one, I was holding an infant that had a seizure. Or rather, I had the seizure. I started squeezing this baby. I couldn't let go, and it had a horrified look on its face, and that woke me up. Once I could go back to sleep, I was hit with another. The next one came as soon as I went back to sleep. I was standing in a backyard, then I heard young children's panicked screaming. I ran inside just to see a toddler-aged child running out in front door and the infant slung over his shoulder. I got to the toddler and infant in the driveway where the, dro- or where the toddler dropped the baby. The baby started vomiting a large amount of green fluid. I woke up just as I had picked up the infant and went to call for medics. Immediately upon waking, I clearly heard. Every smart homeowner knows and it faded away. We didn't have a radio or television on, and it seemed like the same kind of commercial mimicry, but with more clarity. On another night, I woke up to a hard slap on the side of my head. I saw my girlfriend standing over me with tears running down her cheeks. She disappeared when I yelled, Why the hell did you hit me? to which my girlfriend laying next to me all along sleepily stated, I didn't hit you. What are you talking about? A couple of weeks after that, my girlfriend went to bed earlier than I. I was on my computer in the finished basement, almost directly under the bedroom. After a few hours, she messaged me, asked me to come upstairs. She said it sounded like there was a block party outside and she heard people talking outside the window. If there had been anything like that, I would have heard it as well. I heard nothing of the sort whilst in pretty much the same side of the house. The neighborhood had been quiet all night for me at least, and we resolved to move the bed just in case we were picking up radio broadcasts or some other odd signal. She had heard the same things as well before I moved in. The adjustment seemed to significantly cut down on the odd commercial noises though I noticed them for a couple of seconds, especially when tensions between her and I were elevated. Over the coming months, there were a host of other small, odd occurrences. After the basement became unnaturally cold, I began to feel like I wasn't alone. I would catch brief glimpses of a naked man facing away from me in the basement. I had a general feeling that I wasn't welcome. The worst instance happened when I was in the middle of remodeling the basement half-bath. I went from sweating to practically freezing in an instant. I felt like something was standing just behind and off to the side with about as much directed menace I'd ever felt. I'm not religious, but I started naming as many saints as I could remember while finished my process. Then I got the hell out of there decided I would stream some games from the basement PC to the upstairs television while my girlfriend slept in. I started having all kinds of bandwidth problems. Then somehow I was signed out of my account. To my knowledge, that needs to be done manually. Shortly after that, she woke up from a bad dream. She was with her mother. They came back to her mother's house to find the door ajar. They found her cats had been messily slaughtered fed to dogs with various anti-Semitic spray paint on them. All throughout this time, our relationship deteriorated. I kept waking up in the middle of the night, flailing. I felt under attack. And one night, I bashed my hand on the nightstand. Another night, I woke up outside, fully clothed. She said I was acting like a lunatic. It all became too much for me. I moved out. I worry about her, so we still keep in contact. Yet another strange thing happened, and this was last night. We were talking on the phone, but I eventually became too tired. I fell asleep. She stayed on the line because listening to me sleep helps calm her. When I woke up, we were disconnected and I checked my messages. She wanted me to call her back. I blearily called her back and started to go back to sleep myself. 
I heard a faint voice on the line, which I brushed off as some podcast on her tablet, until she started responding to me. I perked up a bit and I heard a voice that sounded like mine, though I couldn't make out what was being said. I asked her who she was talking to, which confused her. She thought she was talking to me. I asked her what the voice had said to her. She said it sounded like me asking if she was doing okay, if she had found a job. I told her I had said nothing, though I had heard something that sounded like me. Naturally, this unsettled her as we both know something is wrong in the house. I don't know if there's something in the house itself or if it can be tied to a certain relic that she has. It's a Chakwe, a tribe from Angola Mask, which sort of symbolizes mother being separated from her child as he enters manhood. I've urged her to donate it to some curator, as there's several in the area. The tribe itself is known to use their crafts as commodities, so I can't be certain about that angle, but though I know something in that house is disruptive and loves to do it. Something is desperately trying to reach my mom. To begin, I have this recurring dream that I've been having since middle school. I have it one or two times a year, but it's slowed down since I've gotten older. In the dream, I'm at home, but it isn't my house. It's a big two or three story home that's shaped like a U. I've never seen anything like it before. I go upstairs to my mom's room in this dream and she's on the bed, seizing. My first thought is that she must be possessed. I call my brother in a panic and tell him mom's possessed. He just asks me if we need more bread or milk because he's grocery shopping. We fight back and forth, he refuses to listen, and I eventually hang up and try to help my mom myself. Before I can do anything, she stops seizing and looks out the window. I run to the window that overlooks the pool. That's in the middle of the U, and I see a spirit flying into or out of the pool. I don't hear anything, but I know his name is Chris. My mom is fine again. It's a weird dream to keep having, but I've never thought too much about it. Moving forward to when I was in college, there was a Ouija board that had been on the game shelf of my house for as long as I can remember. None of us have ever touched it or played it, but it has always been there. I asked if I could take it with me to college. I thought it would be fun for my friends and I to use it. I've been very interested in the paranormal, but never really believed in it. I take it, and the first time I use it, I ask if it knows me. It says yes. I ask how. It spells M-A-M-A. I disregard it. My friends and I use it several times after that. Nothing particularly interesting really happens in the hundreds of other uses. One night a few years later, my family is all sitting in a hot tub late at night in late fall in our backyard. We were just looking at the stars, but my little brother suggested that we tell ghost stories. No one could come up with any, so we started talking about weird dreams and the meanings behind them instead. I offered to share mine, as I recently had one that had, well, I guess I'd had it several times before, really. I tell this dream to my family, and my mom and dad turn their necks so quickly to look at each other, I swear I hear them crack. I ask them what's wrong. They say that Chris is just someone from their past. They act awfully strange for a bit before my mom says that she does actually have a ghost story. When my parents were teenagers and still dating, my mom bought a Ouija board, the same one I took with me to college. She convinced my dad to use it with her, and they had fun asking it questions about their future and whatnot. They asked several questions about their future and specifically if they'll ever have their own cars. It answers, Grand Prix. They asked for the name of the ghost they're speaking to, and it said, Christopher. They didn't really play with it again due to just lack of interest. Several months, maybe years, after their first experience, 
My mom buys her first car, and lo and behold, it's a Grand Prix. I think the fact that the Ouija board predicted that was a realization that they had had several months after the purchase. Could be chalked up to subconscious, but it is a little weird. I will refer to my mom as M from here on. Several months after the car, my parents are visiting friends in another state. They're there for a Super Bowl party, I think. They're out of snacks for the party, so my mom offers to drive to the store to get some. Now, my mom has always been a big fan of personalized license plates. So, of course, her Grand Prix has a license plate that said, M's GP. She gets to the grocery store, and a bag boy helped her carry her groceries to her car. They're loading them into the truck, and he sees her license plate. Is your name M? Yeah, and it's my Grand Prix. Why? My friends and I were playing with a Ouija board the other night, and it just kept saying, Where M? Where M? She didn't talk any longer with the bag boy in exchange of any kind of information. Now to top things off, I'm working at my first job after college. I've been here for nearly two years, and only a few weeks ago did I realize the building I work in is three stories tall and shaped like a U. It is nearly identical to the one from my dream, save for the fact that there's a courtyard instead of a pool in the center. I'd love to hear any thoughts. It definitely feels like somebody's looking for my mom, and now going through me to find her. I don't know if it's worth noting, but my mom also seems to have a sort of sixth sense. She has dreams about people in strange rooms before they die. She ran into someone at the grocery store and thought, he doesn't seem well, weeks before he's diagnosed with cancer, and was outwardly 100% fine and normal. She's told me that a few times as a child, she's been so angry with someone, like bullying her brother, that she can't stop thinking about how much she hates them. And then they would die shortly after. Reminds me of my mom. My tall hat man, not sleep paralysis. As a kid, I always see shadow figures. No matter the time of day, I still see them too. That's till this day, but nothing as much as I did back then. But being older now and with the greatness of sharing on social media, one thing out of the many other shadows I used to always see was what I called the hat man. Funny enough, that's actually what he's called by others, but mine looked a bit tad different to the pictures online or what others have drawn. Besides being a shadow figure that everyone else sees, he was a tall eight or nine foot figure. He had a tall hat as well, sort of like Abraham Lincoln's. He would have to bend his body in order to fit into my room, and sometimes in very disfigured ways. Most times I couldn't figure out if he was bending backwards or hunched forward at times. I could also slightly make out his clothing. He wore like a suit with a bow tie and a trench coat. His arms were also ridiculously long. They went slightly past his thighs. Looking it up now and reading about him out of curiosity, the only things I have found about him are sleep paralysis. But the thing is, I never was in any paralysis when seeing him I could move perfectly. I know this because I was terrified at times and I would run to my parents and sleep with them for the night. Or other times I would turn away and hide underneath my covers. If I knew I'd get in trouble for waking them up. It was almost like every night on that sort of a basis of me seeing things and crying. Sometimes I would have trouble sleeping and look in the corner of the room and he would just suddenly appear. I've also experienced sleep paralysis plenty before when I was older and what I experienced then, not being able to make a sound or cry, the inability to move, wasn't anything like that when I would see him. I would also see him during the day, not as much as night. He would be in dim rooms or shadowed places. A few times when I was older, like 14 or 15, he followed me around a bit, hiding behind corners and objects.
special baby. A little background first. I am a sensitive, and I have seen ghosts, spirits, and demons in unknown things. I currently have a 10-month-year-old daughter. Or a 10-month-old daughter. <laughs> She'd been walking the last few weeks pretty well, and it's sooner than other babies around us. Her crib is still in our bedroom next to my side of the bed. It's a proper crib with the mattress lowered so she can't fall out and can stand up. There's a nightlight at the foot of her crib that's always on. It's the middle of the night. We are all asleep. I wake up to something brushing my face lightly, maybe like air. And anyways, I open my eyes a little confused while I'm awake. I lightly hear my baby whispering and light laughing. I open my eyes and I look around. I see her walking next to the bed, wobbling and holding on the side of the bed to the crib to balance. She hasn't had to hold on for a few weeks. I'm scared thinking that she must have fallen out of her crib somehow and is hurt. Then I think maybe I slept in. Husband took her out and let her wake me up. I'm starting to sit up and she starts walking back toward my way, closer to the head of the crib. She keeps looking inside the crib, excited and lightly laughing and whispering. I hear her husband snoring behind me and realize something's wrong. I sit up a little and get ready to pick her up to check her. Make sure she's not hurt, of course. However, she's escaped. That's when I noticed. I could see her sleeping inside the crib. I sit up all the way and throw my blanket off. The baby's now with its back to me at the head of the crib, and I yell, what the fuck? It turns, looks at me, and walks into the wall. It had no face, just a blur. Now I'm mad, and I yell, what the fuck, again. I check my daughter. She's fine, sleeping. I get up, bless the whole room with holy water, and go back to bed. Sleeping peacefully now, I'm woken up again. Now there's a light laugh and a noise back again. It was by the foot of the crib again. I don't see anything, I just feel it. I had enough of this shit. I got up, picked up my daughter, and put her to sleep in the middle of us. Whatever that face-giggling thing was, I was over it. Unless you have some lotto numbers, don't keep waking me up with no face. After speaking to a few elders, I was told that it was just a friendly spirit. Nothing evil. That's why it was allowed to enter even after being blessed. It just wanted to play and changed its form. That's why it had no face. My daughter had been showing signs of being sensitive as well, which I'll save for another day. My Two Encounters with Shadow People I used to suffer from sleep paralysis a lot. It's always been terrifying, but there's just two instances where that happened and it was just completely out of the normal. The first time I was like 15 maybe, I was going through a phase where I was starting to believe in God and was learning about Him and reading the Bible. Sleep paralysis usually happens in the middle of the night, but this time it happened early in the morning was like my head was dragged to the curtains by itself, and I could clearly see two red eyes. When I had sleep paralysis, you could hear anything. Maybe like a resemblance of shouts, but nothing clear. But this time was different. With a really unsettling voice, the eyes were telling me to do it. They told me to do it over and over again. I couldn't snap out of it for a really long time. I couldn't even talk back to it inside my mind or anything. When it was over, I was really skeptical about what had happened. Part of me didn't believe it was real, and the other part trying to make sense of it. Couldn't understand what it was. I had no idea what this thing wanted me to do. So, I kept it for myself for a long time. But later told my grandma asked her what she thought this thing wanted me to do. She advised me not, excuse me, she advised me not to even try to learn. She just wanted me to just pray. 
I had thought maybe I was a bit biased since I was reading the Bible for the first time. Maybe my mind made a demon for me. But the truth is, the demon is not very demonic in the Bible. Yeah, that means normal beyond standards, but he is never described in any way, and when you read what he says, he just sounds like a regular man making people or God questions themselves. The red eyes didn't mention anything about religion, and I didn't really take it in that way. Still, maybe it had something to do with it, if it was real. The second time I saw them was ten times more terrifying. I was working for a friend looking after her country house, and that was while her family was away. I was having a really hard time, and the place was just enormous, had no way of stopping people from jumping the small grids. Some places you could stick through without even jumping. Her family was rather wealthy too, having a lot of valuables inside the house. From the house to the nearest entrance must have been like a kilometer. And there's... I learned that the woods, anyway, are not like in the movies. You take five steps away from the light that the house gives you, and it's pitch black. You won't see one meter in front of you. And it was as if flashlights got their light sucked out of them. Using them would give you, like, maybe three more meters in one direction. I was in the process of buying a gun when my friend forbade it. I don't live in the USA where people are okay with guns. She didn't like the idea of me killing someone who was just planning to steal a couple of oranges out of fear. I asked for a crossbow. She told me that there wouldn't be any weapons in her house if I wanted to keep the job. I used to sleep in her TV room. I wasn't allowed, but that's another story. Mostly because I would play PS4 there until I fell asleep. Always with a knife below my pillow. One day I heard steps on the floor below, and my bad look, I just kind of sleep paralysis as soon as they just woke me up. Hmm. I could hear those cautious steps going up the stairs, cracking without being able to move. Later they got to my couch. I had my face covered with the blanket. I was trying to reach my knife, but I just couldn't move. Later I swear for my life that the guy gently put the cover out of my face. I could stare at him at that point, and it was really dark, and I couldn't see past his hoodie. He had the cap on. After like two seconds and the adrenaline just rushing, I snapped out and hit the guy. Just banished. Perhaps vanished. It was as if it was made of a shadow or out of smoke. I swear I could see the smoke like for two or three seconds before it disappeared toward one of the two paintings upstairs. I told this to my friend and asked her if the painting had some story behind them. She kind of laughed it off and told me that they were old, but that the friar and some fruit had nothing to do with people made out of smoke-wearing clothes from the 21st century. That was like five years ago. I haven't had a similar experience since then, and I truly hope I just don't. I don't believe in this kind of stuff. I don't know if I convinced myself over the years or if it happened so long ago it just didn't feel real anymore. Still, I like in a weird way that I could live something almost took out of a horror movie, real or not. What I perceived almost made me shit myself two times. The Creature I Saw in Our Garden Shed this event happened when I was around 8 or 10 years old in the garden of the house I used to live in. I'm telling this story as I remember it without fabricating anything whatsoever. One day I was playing in my garden. I liked to play with the ball I had or look through the chain link fence which separated our family's property from a river. Now to explain the situation which occurred, I need to explain the shed that we had in the garden. Now, this shed was placed directly at the back of the garden, in the middle of the chain-link fence. This meant I could enter the shed from the front, go to the right side of the shed or the left, but not the back as it was placed in front of the fence. Another important note is that the right wall of the shed had a window that would grant you vision of the inside of the entire shed. One of the things I really enjoyed doing was walking over to the right side of the shed, knocking on the window three times, 
ducking down and then getting up and looking directly at the window. I remember doing this because it was fun for a little me, but of course nothing would ever show itself, and I only did this as a way to role play. This day was very different. Although parts of my memory are hazy, I remember the main event with perfect detail. I was watching the river through the fence when I walked to the right side of the shed. I knocked on the window three times and ducked down. When I jumped back up and looked through the window, a pale white humanoid thing sprouted up and looked at me. I remember it looked at me in the eyes. Then it opened its mouth and started moving it. It wasn't moving it in a way as if it was talking, but it was just moving its lower jaw really fast. It's hard to describe. It was just moving its mouth really quick and I felt maliciousness coming from this creature. After that, it had just ducked back down as quickly as it had came. The situation must have been five seconds long. I remember just staring at that window, dumbfounded, completely shocked at what I saw. Even though remembering the situation now makes me really creeped out and scared, eight to ten-year-old me was more curious and perplexed than scared. So, I did what any curious child would have done, and entered the shed. After all, there was only one way in and one way out, which was the front door. The only window of the shed couldn't be open anyway, so that thing could have been inside. When I walked into the shed, I saw nothing. The shed itself is really small, so there would have been nowhere to hide. I just remember being confused more than anything, so I closed the door and continued playing outside. Looking back at the situation as an adult, I would have absolutely ran away as the thing was only human-shaped, but definitely not from our world. Also, I get scared easily as well. This situation only happened once to me and never again. Even though I played the window and just... Like, well, it's the window knocking ritual, you know? I did that dozens of times after the event occurred. I wouldn't be surprised if it was an overactive imagination and I'm definitely open to that idea. The only problem was that the creature felt so real. I can't imagine young me conjuring such a creepy thing from my mind. I also thought that maybe it was my reflection being slightly distorted as it rose up at the similar time that I did. Only problem with that theory is that the creature ducked down while I was still standing up. Late Night Phone Call When I was about 15 years old, I got a phone call in the middle of the night that still sticks with me to this day. It was around 3 a.m. on a school night, and that's when I woke up to a phone call. I was wondering who the hell would be calling me this late, but it was from an unknown number. I answered the phone, and there was a lot of wind on the other end, like a person was running. They were screaming my name over and over again. They were terrified, like they were being chased or something. My parents are divorced, and at the time, my mom was working three jobs, including one at a casino. My first thought was someone attacking her while she was walking out to her car. I screamed, Mom, Mom, Mom! But the only thing I heard was this person just screaming my name. Then the call dropped. At this point, I'm in tears because I think my mom is getting brutally murdered. So I run upstairs, wake my dad up, and tell him what's going on. He somehow manages to calm me down and tells me he will call my mom's sister. The next day at school, I go to everybody else and I just ask if they prank called me last night. No one admitted to it, and honestly, no one even seemed suspicious. I had a feeling something more sinister was going on, since the person on the other end was literally screaming at the top of their lungs. When I get home, my dad tells me that he would get a hold of my aunt, and that my mom was alright. Couldn't figure out what had happened. Another weird thing about it was the call felt like it only lasted a few minutes, but the call log said it lasted a little over ten minutes. That night I'm getting ready for bed. My dad pokes his head in my room to tell me that my great-grandma passed away last night. Right around the same time I got the phone call. I never met my great-grandma before, but apparently she wasn't a very nice woman. 
Some family members would describe her as a straight-up nasty one. I honestly think I got a call from my great-grandma after she died as she was being dragged to the afterlife. Anyone seen the movie Shadow People? Only real scary shit I ever saw. Oddly enough, I saw a shadow figure in a person myself, and sometimes still do. True story experienced in company, not alone. So two individuals saw the same thing together. I used to live with two other roommates in my previous apartment. I'm in master. One dude in medium and another in a small room. So medium room dude says, Hey, fellas, I'm going out for dinner with my girl. See you boys later. We're all like, I right, dude, catch you laters. Me and small room guy got no plans, so we decide to have dinner together. So we have some Indian food while watching Netflix in the living room. I remember we were watching Helsing. All is good. We had dinner, washed our hands, having some cookies, and settled in the couch watching good TV show and enjoying a Saturday night in. Then all of a sudden, both of us noticed that a shadowy figure just popped its head out of the medium room. The entrance of all rooms is visible from the living room, but not like directly. They're at the far left, so you can catch with your eye if anyone is passing through or not. And of course, be able to hear them. So then it's not just me, but my roommate too. He says, hey, who's there? I'm like, did you see that? He's like, yeah. Didn't the medium room guy leave for dinner? Did he come back? I'm like, we've been sitting here watching TV. How can he go past us through the door without us seeing or hearing him? There's only one entrance to the apartment, and that's also visible from the living room. It's a small place. The whole living plus dining room is like 20 footsteps long in total from end to end. And at the end, there's the main door. So we're both perplexed. So we get up and start checking the whole house. Go into medium guy's room, too. We're all bros, and nobody locks rooms or anything unless they're fucking inside. So no one's in the medium room. We check the bathroom, the small room, master room, kitchen... No one is any fucking where in the entire apartment. Just the two of us. So then we thought maybe we saw a shadow or something move. But that's impossible because we tried to recreate it and failed. Because there's no light source directly in front of the room doors, nothing was flapping or fluttering or moving in any way anywhere. A shadow moving across the walls is very different than a 3D shadow figure popping its head out from a room to take a peek and getting back in. It wasn't just me who saw it. Else, I could think, maybe it was something I've imagined. We weren't drinking, and we don't take any drugs. Since then, sometimes I still notice something looking at me from the corner of my eyes. I catch something moving in my peripheral vision. Sometimes when I look, it's gone. And the only reason I notice is because I'm alone in my new place. And something was moving. And if it was just a shadow on the wall, well, they don't disappear when you look at them. I don't know what to think of this. I'm not scared of anything except stupid people. But I'm just puzzled. Confusion is a confusing feeling for me. Because I don't believe in anything paranormal. There's always a scientific and logical reason for things. This one I just don't know or couldn't have figured out yet. My intuition is crazy accurate 95% of the time. There are times where I'll be driving along and suddenly change my route only to find at the exact time I'd be going through a specific intersection there'd be a crash. Often deadly. This has happened so many times I've lost count. I was attending a New Year's Eve party with a large group of people, approximately 10 years ago, pre-COVID. 
That's when some drunk jock I didn't know showed up and instigated adult activities. Polite way to say that. This is so he could watch and listen. You, which irked everyone. So they all chased him out. They then worried that he'd kill someone. He was that drunk. So I mediated for a moment, turned to my closest friend at the time, and told him straight-faced, Don't worry, I'll take care of it. Only to get a call from the dude's girlfriend, blaming us for the dude's arrest at the end of the driveway for drunk driving. I woke up before my alarm by almost three hours on 9-11. I had a sense of dread. I knew that it was going to be a very bad day. I couldn't shake the feeling. I arrived at school seconds after the first tower was attacked and watched the second tower get hit live. I knew the day my grandmother was going to pass away. That was three days beforehand. I was desperately trying to get to the nursing home that she was in and I visited daily. I wanted to visit for one final one to say goodbye before she passed. I knew the moment she passed too, approximately 15 minutes prior to the notification phone call. I inexplicably knew that we'd end up with our favorite Cheeto in chief, and the second he announced that he was running for president, and that these last four years would be rife with death, destruction, and a depressing repeat of history. My insomnia just kicks up nearly every major disaster. This past Sunday, 5-31-2020 was no different. I took my oldest son to get an early birthday present, a new rim for his bicycle. It was close to 4.15 p.m. when I had that same dread from 9-11 wash over me and was dying to just get out of the area. We finally left just before our mayor initiated an emergency. It was a curfew for our downtown area because of the riots. I averaged maybe three hours of sleep a night or two prior, feeling the dread creeping up. Tonight or this morning, it's almost 2 a.m., and as I type this, the dread is only getting worse instead of better. I'm not sure what fresh hell will greet us over the next few days, but it's only getting worse. Anyone else out there have this problem too? I can only sense horrible things to come, and it's incredibly frustrating. Once Upon a Nightmare Hide and seek. An innocent enough game, right? Well, maybe in some houses, but not my child at home. My brother and I are about a year and 25 days apart, age-wise. Absolutely hated each other. Found that we enjoyed tormenting each other. A lot of this had to do with family dynamic, which, in all honesty, just kind of belongs in a different Reddit post but I'm here to tell you about a terrifying experience I had when I was young. Not complain about my family, even though my brother's relevance is minorly outlined here. A lot of strange things happened in my first house that I remember. My brother and I were always told that we had hyperactive imaginations, and that's what had us seeing things and hearing voices that weren't there. Things consistently got worse over time and our sleep began to suffer. After one of my more restless nights, my brother and I decided on a game of hide-and-seek. The house was built in 1901, and we had a lot of stuff. My grandmother was what would be classified as a hoarder today. I was incredibly clever. I used my small stature to my advantage, often to scare the daylights out of my younger brother. I always had my hiding spots planned out three turns in advance and had settled on hiding in one of the best places I knew. One of the two closets in my bedroom. My brother's bedroom didn't have any closets, so I had to share one of my closets with him. I chose my closet to hide in. My closet was relatively easy to open at all times. It often wouldn't latch properly and would swing open in the middle of the night, usually scaring the bejeebus out of me each time it happened. Using this to my advantage, I had most of my stuffed animals in the bottom of the closet. I situated myself in such a way that I can see the door when it opened, 
so that I could jump out and scare my brother. Just as I finally settled, I heard this strange growl above my head in the pitch dark. Confused because none of our dogs were in the closet with me, I looked up and I froze. Staring down at me was a severed wolf's head, lips curled back in a menacing snarl. I tried to scream. No sound came out. Then it spoke to me. Get out or die. Bewildered at the sight, I dashed for the doorknob and attempted to open the door, but it was stuck. I could hear it still talking, but I was too determined to get out of the closet to hear what it was saying. When it finally finished speaking to me, the door swung wide open and fell out onto the floor, crying my eyes out. I quickly rolled over to see if it was coming at me. Luckily, it was gone. That was the last time I ever played hide-and-seek in that house. Psychic communicates with my dead brother. So I'll start this story out with a bit of background. My older brother died in a pretty bad car accident about three years ago. I got a call from my dad early that morning telling me my older brother was in the hospital and things weren't looking good. So I went to the hospital and my first reaction was nausea and shock to see my brother hooked up to machines in a coma looking so small and lifeless. As the day went on, my shock hadn't entirely worn off. But I started to feel so angry. Angry that this had happened and angry that he was in this position. The car accident was his fault, but he had been drinking, he was driving too fast and lost control of the car. I was mad at him for what he'd done. He passed away a couple of days ago and I was devastated. Still angry and confused and basically a crying mess. So then fast forward to maybe six-ish months later. My whole family is reeling from the loss of my brother and my aunt and two uncles decide to have a psychic over. At first it was kind of a joke, none of them believe in anything supernatural. But my aunt told me that she finally had the courage to ask about my brother and the psychic said, wanted to say that he was doing okay. I didn't get all the details since I wasn't there. Then the psychic says that my brother asks, Is she still mad at me? I've never expressed my feelings of anger with anyone else in my family because it made me feel terrible. I love my brother, and I was scared of feeling that way, but anyway, my aunt and uncles ask my brother who he's talking about, and the psychic apparently looks puzzled for a minute and then says, I'm not sure, I can only see fireworks. This is major because my birthday is July 4th, Independence Day in the U.S., which fireworks are a staple for. I have no idea what to think about this whole thing. I still think about it all the time. I'm no longer angry at my brother, and I've tried to express that to him, but I'm not even a believer in the supernatural, so I don't exactly know how. I hope that he knows that I'm not mad anymore, and, well, that I love and miss him so much. Some weird shit happened when I was four. I can't forget it. It was Boston, the dead of night after Christmas Day of 84. I had just turned four. It was a good year for presents. The one thing I got was a tent bed, like a pop-up tent that you fit over your mattress. I slept on one side of the house while my parents and three sisters slept on the other. We were separated by the kitchen. It was a very old house. And the living room. I woke up in the middle of the night to a noise coming from the living room that sounded like random digital tones. At least I recognize that now. Like the first 10 seconds of ELO's telephone line. I was clutching my Cabbage Patch Kid doll. My sister had one, so my parents got me the boy Red Sox themed one. I rolled over and I could see out of the vents at the top of the tent like a cascade of tiny, shiny diamond shapes. They were floating down around my tent bed. Not through the vent. It didn't scare me or anything. I just thought, hey, look at that. Pretty interesting. 
don't see that every day. Still carrying my Cabbage Patch doll, I unzipped the tent bed and walked to my door because I assumed my sister's gonna get an ass whooping. She was up playing with one of the new toys, specifically a Monkey C Radio Shack calculator that she had that made noises. When I got to the threshold, I saw something standing in the kitchen about five feet in front of me. It was a three-foot-tall humanoid blue creature, looking like it was made of modeling clay. It was holding my mom's ancient copy of The Joy of Cooking, and it was reading it, and then looked directly at me with its mouth just round like an O. I assumed in surprise. I immediately noped the fuck out of there, jumped into my tent bed, clutching the cabbage patch doll tightly. I was completely terrified, and just stayed like that until I eventually fell asleep. Nothing happened like that before or since I remember it like yesterday, though. She patted me on the back to comfort me. I was very close to my nanny. She was barely five feet tall and big on hugging and patting her loved ones. I was living overseas, which was in 1993. That's when she was diagnosed with a return of breast cancer. I flew back to see her a month or so after her diagnosis took her to her radiation treatments and manicured her nails and watched her stories, soap operas. I did that every day. And after a wonderful visit, which ended with hugs and pats with her little arthritic hands and so many I love yous, I flew home, sure she was going to beat it. Then that phone call saying the treatments hadn't worked and that she couldn't survive. I couldn't afford to fly home again so soon. Nanny passed the message that she didn't want me to see her so sick. Then the dreaded call when she died. I was devastated, totally shattered. The day of her funeral, feeling a million miles from all my loved ones, I got in the shower thinking about Nanny and I started to cry. I knew nobody could hear me in the shower, so I really let go and sobbed. I was standing facing the water my back exposed in the rear, and in the middle of my grief, I felt a small, warm hand patting me about the shoulder blade height. I whipped around, embarrassed to have been caught howling with grief, but there was nobody there. We had glass shower doors, and I could see that nobody was in the bathroom. I know in my heart that my precious little nanny was comforting me. She knew how much I loved her, and, well, that her death left a hole in my heart. She didn't want me to grieve like that, and she was letting me know that she was still with me, although I couldn't see her. I've never seen or felt anything else since she died, but I can still remember the comfort of her little hand when I needed it most. Civil War Lady and Heavy Breathing when I was 11, being 1974, we moved into a house built around 1900. It was built on the site of an earlier house, and this was in rural Virginia near the Civil War battlefields. Our house had been vacated by an old man who lived there for 50 years, and his wife had died in the house years before. He left a lot of family junk behind, trunks full of clothes and letters written during World War II, old furniture. I loved exploring the house and digging through all the old belongings. My parents were slowly cleaning it all out and remodeling it. One day I went up to the attic to look through some trunks. I looked through some old photos and letters, then opened a trunk that had a collapsed hoop skirt and some old long dresses. While I was digging through the trunk, I heard someone coming up to the attic stairs. I was sure it was my little sister following me. I was kneeling next to the trunk and looking toward the stairs when I saw the head and shoulders of a young woman I didn't know coming up. She was looking down at her feet and walking normally up the stairs, making climbing noises. As she came up, I noticed that she had like a long blue dress and was holding the front of it up as she climbed the stairs. 
I could see ankle-high boots and short heels. When she got to the top of the stairs, my eyes were basically bugging out at this point, I could see all of her. She was wearing a Civil War era dress with a hoop skirt and her dark brown hair was in a snood in the back. She stopped to smooth down her dress and then took a step toward the piles of trunks and junk. I could clearly see her face and clothing. She looked like a real human, not like a see-through ghosty one. At that point, she saw me crouched by the trunks and looked startled. Then she disappeared, but I never saw or heard her again. I was shocked, but not afraid. I kept that hoop skirt and played with it for months until it disintegrated with age. Later, my mother told me her own spooky story from that house. My dad had gone to work and my sister and I were at school. She decided to vacuum the downstairs, so she turned on the vacuum and got started. She became aware of the sound of breathing and ignored it. The breathing got louder and louder until she couldn't ignore it. So she turned off the vacuum and listened, scared of course. It occurred to her that it might have been an old man's wife who died looking for him. So she explained where Mr. X had gone to live. She explained that we loved the house and that we were going to fix it up and take good care of it. After she explained, the breathing slowly faded quieter and quieter until it ended. Mom never heard or saw anything else unexplained in that house, but she's convinced that Mr. X has come to visit her husband and couldn't find him, so she contacted Mom by breathing to get her attention. Children's Voices at Night We lived in New England years ago, in a newer house with the bedrooms upstairs. Our kids were small at the time, so I had a baby monitor set up next to my bed for the youngest kid's room. In the middle of the night I woke up hearing the distant sounds of several children talking and laughing, sort of like the noises you'd hear in a playground. I sat up, put my ear closer to the baby monitor, thinking maybe our son woke up and was playing in his crib, but the sounds weren't coming from there. I lowered the volume all the way and could still hear children playing. It wasn't coming from the direction of the kids' room, but from the master bathroom on the end of the house. I got up and walked toward the bathroom, puzzled and listening. The voices got louder as I approached. Childish shrieks, the chanting of a game and laughter. All my hair was standing up. I gathered my courage to take that final step around the corner into the bathroom. The second I stepped into the doorway, silence. Nothing was there. No noise at all. I checked the kids' room and all of them were sound asleep. Hubby never woke up during any of this. I went downstairs and looked around, checking that doors were locked. I laid awake for a long time after I got back to bed. Not really scared but definitely puzzled. I asked an older neighbor what was on her property before her house was built, thinking maybe there had been an old school or a house with kids. He said it was dairy farmland as far back as he could remember, 70 years. I never heard children playing again, but I can hear it in my head as clearly as the night that it happened, and probably as clearly as you'll hear me say, See ya.